Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yali Ushibanjo, who has just left us. The Chairman of the Occasion, Your Excellency, Alaji Bilu Masari, the Executive Governor of Kasima State. Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, our chief host, uh, Mr. Azubike Ishebwene, and members of the board of Banks and All, the publishers of the interview magazine. Please also permit me to recognize my spiritual father, Pastor Sam Adeyemi, who is here present, the senior pastor of this Christian Center. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gabriel Obechi, I'm the Managing Director of Rain Oil Limited. I'm here today to weigh in on the topic of our today's discussion, why startups fail and strategies for survival. Why startups fail and strategies for survival. Let me first and foremost commend the organizers of today's event for choosing such a topical issue at a time like this. With a very high level of unemployment in Nigeria today, it's obvious that the government cannot do it alone. The government alone cannot provide all the employment that we need in this country. As a matter of fact, the private sector is and remains the biggest employer of labor. So it's in our interest that people not only start businesses, but that these businesses also thrive and survive to keep providing the employment that we so desperately need in this country. I listened to Atubike Ishebwene share his own experience in trying to start up the interview magazine. I stand here today to talk essentially from my own perspective on how to uh, how we started our own business and how we can help people um, survive in this environment. Again, my name is Gabriel Ubeche. I run a company called Rain Oil Limited. Rain Oil Limited is a company that plays in the downstream sector of the Nigerian oil and gas industry. We've been in existence for about 19 going 20 years now. I recall I left the university in 1987, did my service in Kano in 1987-1988, joined the company um, in Kano, a vegetable oil company, Shadai Debo Oils Limited, where I worked briefly, then came down to Lagos, joined a company called Price of a House. Then in 1992, I joined Ascon Oil Company Limited, an oil marketing company. I was in Ascon 92, 93, 94, and I recall, I was on a salary of 30,000 Naira a month. I asked myself a very simple question. Gabriel, what else can you do to make 30,000 Naira a month? I asked myself that question because I believe then, as I still believe today, that anything you can do to make your salary can take the place of your job. It doesn't matter where you work, whether you work for Zenith Bank, whether you work for Chevron, you have a salary of 500,000 Naira a month. Anything you can do between 8 to 5 to make that same 500,000 Naira can replace that job. So I asked myself that question and I said, hey, bro, if I can sell one truck of diesel, one, one truck of diesel, I will make one Naira per liter, which was 30,000 Naira. 92, 93, 94, a truck of diesel, 30,000 liters. We're buying diesel for 9 naira per liter. We're selling for 10 naira per liter. Margin was 1 naira. So I said, if I can sell one truck of diesel, I will make 30,000. So even if I supply one truck of diesel and go home and sleep for 30 days, come out after 30 days, collect my check, I would have made 30,000 naira, which was my salary. But first things first, I needed to incorporate a company. So I recall 1994, my wife and I went to meet a friend of ours uh, who is a lawyer and also a pastor, November 1994. So we went to him and said, we need to start a company, an oil company. 
So he said, what name do we give to the company? So they are banding names around. Why don't you call it that oil? Why don't you call it this oil? Why don't you call it that oil? And then if I said, no, Gabriel, you know what? Rain stands for blessing. Why don't you call it rain oil? And I said, then if I know what you're right. But instead of rain oil, we're going to make the rain and the oil together to get one word, which is rain oil limited. That was how Rain Oil Limited was incorporated in November 1994. I called that step one. I took my certificate of incorporation, put it up in my drawer. Recall, I, a truck of diesel was 300,000 naira. I needed to raise the money. I didn't have the money. I wrote proposals. I went to those who I knew had the money. I had no doubt whatsoever in my mind that it was going to work. I mean, I was working for another company. I see money being made. I understood the business, but I didn't have the money. I wrote proposals, and all I got was, meet me here. Gabriel, can we have a meeting at Oniko at 7 p.m.? Can we meet at Ikoi Club? Stories. So I learned my first lesson. People rarely give money to those who don't have. But I had a habit. My office was in a solo, for those of us who know labor as well. I was doing a lot of work out of the NMPC depot in Ichigo. With as little as 1,000 naira, I would drive from my office in the solo to Bank Anthony Way to meet my stockbroker. Maybe they buy me 1,000 units of seven. With 2,000 naira, I would go to Bank Anthony Way. Maybe they buy me 500 units of Nigerian breweries. Little by little. By late 1996, I was getting frustrated. I couldn't raise the 300,000 I got up one evening in my house. I brought out my capital market file. And I started itemizing all the stock one by one. 1,000 units of 7 or percent to go per share, 700 naira. 2,000 units of First Bank at 6 naira per share, 12,000 naira. I itemized the stock. I surprised myself. It went into two pages. By the time I summed them all, it came to 497,000 naira. I was shocked. I got out the shares, those are the days of share certificates, not these days of CSCS. I got out the share certificates, I went back to the same stockbroker. He verified the ones he could verify. He sold the ones he could sell. By the end of the day, I had my 300,000 naira. Recall, I had a hypothesis, which was that if I sell a truck of diesel, I'll make how much? 30,000 naira, one naira per liter. And now we have to go into the marketplace to test this hypothesis. I identified a company in Kedja called First Aluminium Nigeria PLC. I had a classmate in the university who was working there as an engineer. So he introduced me to the purchasing manager. I was a salesman, I'm still a salesman. So I had no problems convincing the purchasing manager, one Mr. Ujo, to give me an LPO for 30,000 liters of diesel at 10 naira per share, 10 naira per liter, 300,000 naira. So he told me to come this faithful Tuesday to pick my LPO. So I went there that day, very excited. I heard Mr. Ujo have a part of the LPO. He said, ah, the LPO is not ready. I said, why? He said, the GM refused to sign. I said, who is GM? I got up. Mr. So Joe thought I was leaving. I knew the GM, the man called Mr. Ija Halebu. We had an office down the corridor with a secretary who used to sit to the right of his door. <laughs> I knew that if I made the mistake of telling the secretary I wanted to see the GM, that would have been the end of it. So I approached the door. Good afternoon, man. Before she could open her eyes, and open the GM's office, and I was in the GM's office. Yeah, young man, what can I do for you? Uh, my name is Gabriel, I'm from Rain Oil. My LPO is on your table. Please help me sign. Say, which one is Rain Oil? We only buy from Mogul and Total and Unipetrol. I did all the marketing I could do that day. I got a who wasn't ready to sign this LPO. Gabriel Obecha wasn't ready to go anywhere. He was seated. I was standing. At some point, he got tired of me. He wanted to leave me in his office. So he got up. As he approached the door, 
I use my body to block the door. <laughs> Help a young man who wants to grow. Sign this appeal. IJ looked at me long and hard. Went back to his table, signed the LPO, gave it to me and said, I don't want to ever see you in my office. <laughs> I said, thank you very much, sir. I took the LPO, made the supply. By the time we made the supply, prices had moved. Instead of making 30,000 naira, we made 45,000 naira. Wow. First Union paid, I still remember, they paid in December 1996. By the time the check cleared, they gave us an SGBN check drawn on SGBN, SGBN, SGBN on Obaakran. I still remember very well. My very first check, I can't forget. You know, by the time we got value on the check, Christmas had come, went home for Christmas, came back in January, we made the second supply. This time it was to Limka on Abimbola Way in the solo. Limka paid cash, margin 60,000 naira. was working. The third supply, this time, was the United Spinners on the the Expressway in Amu or Dauphin. I still remember the driver stole part of the product, there was a shortage. <laughs> <laughs> the driver shot that truck, 500 liters, I don't forget. You know? So instead of making 30,000 naira, the market only came to 25,000 naira, but they didn't pay us in full. Later will understand what I'm talking about. We deal with truck drivers every day. Margin 25,000 naira. It was working. Step by step, by May 1997, it became obvious that it was sustainable. And then I left my job. Because during this period, I was still keeping my employment. You know, Warren Buffet, one of his books says, if you want to test how deep a river is, you don't go with two legs, you go with one leg first. You know, so by May 1997, we left our job to start to replace. Reno Limited squarely. And from this foundation of 300,000 Naira in 1996, 1997, we've been able to grow the business to what it is today. Today, Reno Limited, we own about 40 petrol stations spread across this country. We own a 50 million liter capacity petroleum storage depot in our in Delta State. We own another 40 million liter capacity petroleum storage depot in the Calabar Free Trade Zone in Calabar Cross River State. We own a fleet of about 80 trucks which to distribute petroleum products across this country. And we also own six ships with which we import petroleum products into this country, providing direct employment to more than 700 people, all from the foundation. All from a foundation of 300,000 Naira in 1996, to the glory of God. Now, um, it is estimated that between 70 to 90 percent of all startups fail globally. As a matter of fact, the statistic states that. About 96% of all startups fail within the first 10 years. So actually, only about 40% of all startups survive up to 10 years. It's a very grim number, but it is not a number that should discourage any of us who want to venture into entrepreneurship. I tell people, the most important thing you need in any business you want to do, is knowledge. The most important thing you need in any business you want to do is knowledge. A lot of people think it's capital. I say no, it is knowledge. If you put knowledge in front and capital is trailing knowledge, what tends to happen is that your knowledge will act as a protective shield over the capital. If you put capital in front and knowledge is trailing capital, what tends to happen is that you tend to lose the capital to acquire the knowledge. And that's when we say you have learned the hard way. I wish we don't learn the hard way. You see, there's money in this country. There's too much money in this country. As a matter of fact, there's so much money, money begging to be made. But the key thing is, you see, 
I don't do oil and gas. But it's because I worked for an oil and gas company for five years. I understood how the oil and gas industry works. But I don't delude myself that it's only in oil and gas that you make money. Those who are in IT are making money. Those who are into properties are making money. Those who are into aviation, like I see my friend there, uh, is making money. I mean, those who are into every sector, I mean, if you look at the whole of Abuja, properties everywhere. How many of them do you think are into oil and gas? The key thing is, do what you understand. Do what you understand. Insofar as you do what you understand, you will make money. You know, another thing, if you want to survive, where do you set up your business? What's the location of your business? If you don't have the right location, it will be difficult for your business to thrive. You know, I see people, a lot of people, you see some rich kids, you know, money is not a problem. They want to, they want to set up a business. Uh, the capital is there. They set up a shop. The shop is well equipped. The brand new car is parked outside. You see, you are only in business when your income exceeds your expenditure. <laughs> if your income does not exceed your expenditure, you've only created activity. You've only created activity. You know, people set up shop, and then at the end of the at the end of the month, at the end of the year, you can't. You want to go restock your goods, somebody has to give you money. It is not working. It is not working. Insofar as, in so far as your income does not exceed your expenditure, then you are not in business. What kind of product do you have? Is it a product that the market needs? Does the market need your product? So if you want to do business, you must be sure that you think through the product you are introducing into the market. You must do proper feasibility study and be sure that the market needs the product which you are bringing. Another thing I want to talk about is your strategy. What strategy do you have for the business you want to run? I mean, for those of us in the oil industry, you want to build a petrol station, for example. Where do you build the petrol station? Is the location right? What kind of competition do you have in the place? You must do a proper traffic count. If you don't have the right strategy and you just go ahead and build it, you're definitely going to struggle. I tell people, if I drive from Lagos to Abuja by road, every single petrol station I see on the road, I will look at it. I will analyze it. As a matter of fact, when I see a station that has been built by somebody who is in the industry, I know. If I see a petrol station that has been built by somebody who has made money outside and come to invest in the business, I know. Because the kind of petrol station you build tells me how much knowledge of the industry you have. For example, in a petrol station, I tell people, those of you here who buy fuel, how many of you in the last one year have actually come out of your car and leave the forecourt to step into the station building? Most of the activities end within the forecourt. So when you see people building gigantic station building, Instead of concentrating on the four courts where the business actually is, you know that the person is not an industry person. So you must have the right strategy. Then, of course, you need to have proper customer service orientation. You are only in business because you have customers. The customers are not there because of you. You are there because of the customers. So if you don't focus on your customers, you're definitely going to struggle. Let me tell you this, for those of us, I mean I tell my staff that those of us who sell petroleum products, um, we are lucky, we are actually lucky in this country because you are selling a fast moving consumer good. I tell people, I don't know of any product that sells faster than petroleum products. Petrol, you know when there is scarcity, you want petrol, I mean you want it so <coughs> desperately. So the fact that people, you have a product that largely sells itself. Have you seen anybody advertise petrol in this country? <laughs> you don't have to advertise petrol, it sells itself. But regardless of the fact that the product sells itself, the principles cannot be broken. The principles can be broken. Your customers are your customers, and you must treat them right. I have a plant farm in Calabar. I mean, I was in Calabar a few days ago. And I, I called my head of sales and I said, 
The time was, I came to Calabar during the heat of the scarcity. I mean, so many people were outside banging at the gates because they want petrol, they want to buy petrol. And the, the salesman was like, if I was telling him that he wasn't selling, he was doing allocation because people, I mean, far more people wanted the product than the quantity he had to give. So he wasn't treating the customers like as far as I was concerned. And I warned him about it and I said, because things will change. They still remain your customers. I was in Calabar a few days ago. The place was very quiet. There's petrol everywhere. Nobody's begging to buy petrol. And I called him and I said, do you remember the last time when you had so much crowd here? Where is the crowd now? Now you have to go look for them. And if you treat them well, regardless of the situation, they will keep coming back whether there is actual scarcity or there is gloss. The next thing I want to talk about is financial discipline. Financial discipline. If you want to run a successful business, you must be financially very disciplined. You must be able to see money and keep your cool. For me, money is just a number. It's just a number. 100 million, 200 million, it means nothing. It's just a number. You see, for the employee, money is for consumption. For the entrepreneur, money is for production. When you are in paid employment, you earn your salary. What do they want to do? They pay house rent, money for feeding, money for school fees, a little bit of savings here. But for the businessman, the businessman must keep thinking of the next project. You must keep thinking of what next to do with the money. Because you see, when you are in paid employment, let me say for example, you get a job with Nestle. You get a job as a cost accountant. The day you, the day you resume, there's a desk for you, there's a laptop, probably there's a cool car with a driver that has to take it the way you're going to go. So you just come and you slot into that system. When you run your own business, not only do you have to employ yourself, you also have to invest in the structures that will support that employment. So you must be able to see money and keep your cool because money is just a number. And then again, you must have the, you must have the right mindset. You must have the, what I call the right mindset for money. What do I call the right mindset? I'll give you an example. Let me say you're, you're into real estate. You want to do you want to do an estate. Luckily, you've gotten the land. You've done the design. Your QS have costed it. It's going to cost you say eight hundred million naira to do the estate. And then you go to the bank. How much do I have there? They give you the number. You have two hundred million naira. Do you have money? Does the person have money? He doesn't have money. If you want to do a project of 800 million naira and all you have is 200 million naira, you don't have money. You're broke. You're broke to the tune of 600 million naira. So you can so you cannot just begin to spend money because you have 200 million naira. It's a mindset. And of course, somebody who is in paid employment, if the person has 50 million naira in his account, of course, the mindset is that. The person has money. Then you must keep your earnings in the business. Keep your earnings in the business. Brain oil is a company that we have built largely with internally retained earnings. As you make money, you keep the, keep the money in the business. You cannot keep spending the money that you make. As you make money, keep the money in the business because the best way to grow a business is through internally retained earnings. You have money, you have one petrol station. As you have one petrol station and that petrol station is producing, then suddenly you get two, you get three, you get four. A time comes when, when you have 10 or 20 petrol stations contributing to the pool. You find out that the rate at which you regenerate the business becomes very high. So you must keep your earnings in the business. Another thing I want to talk about is that you need to keep records. If you want to survive as a startup, you need to keep, you need to keep records, you need to keep very good records. 
There's something I have done for the past 19 years. I do it at the end of every month. You know, at the end of every month, I bring out my own diary. In my own handwriting, I call it financial position at the end of 30th of August 2016. Every month. I want to know the financial position of the business. Cash. How much cash do we have in the bank? Who are we owing? How much stock do we have? How much receivable do we have? Do we have goods in transit? Purely cash accounting. You know, accountants like to speak big English. They talk of things like depreciation, amortization, a bit that, whatever that means. As an entrepreneur and as a businessman, you need to stay on top of your cash. At the end of every month, you want to know how healthy is this business. How much cash do I have? If all my creditors come today now and say, give me my money, can you pay them? If all, all the creditors you have now, all the banks, come on their facilities, do you have enough liquidity to be able to pay them? For example, if I want to do an asset, if I want to do an asset investment, one thing I do, I look at the cash position, I mean the pure liquidity position. If after taking care of all the liabilities, we still have our own liquid cash, then we can go ahead and do the business. Because the truth is that in this economy, interest rates today is about 20%. If you borrow money at 20% to do assets, you will struggle. Make no mistake about it, you will struggle. The best way to grow the business is through your own retained earnings and your own cash. Of course, you have to bring in some mixture of debt into the business, but it has to be a very healthy uh, debt and equity mix. If the business is skewed heavily in favor of debt and you're paying 20% interest, 20% interest, because that 20% is actually compound interest, it means that in about four years, the money is going to double. And I don't know what business you're going to, I don't know what business you're going to do I don't know what asset you're going to buy that can pay for itself within four years. But if the, if, the, if the asset, if the funding of the asset is skewed heavily in favor of equity and less in favor of debt, then of course uh, you stand a good chance of surviving. Then another thing I want to talk about is you need to branch out. I will tell you one thing. In any business you do, in any location you find yourself, it's only a matter of time. Competition will catch up with you. In any business you do, in any location you find yourself, it's only a matter of time. Competition will catch up with you. Because you see, when you find yourself in a location and you're making money, people are taking notice. You open a fashion shop on a Adeshola, and your, your business is booming for you. People are taking notice. I've given this example a couple of times. I've given this example a couple of times. In 1997, I still remember Christmas Day 1997, my wife and I and my son, we went to Mr. Biggs on Allen in, in Ikeja in Lagos, for those of us who know Lagos well. Christmas Day out here, we're going to Mr. Biggs. Why? In 1997, Mr. Biggs in Lagos was a big deal. It was a big deal that you go to Mr. Biggs on an outing. Around the year 2000-2001, tantalizers came to Allen Roundabout in Kenya. Tantalizers was such a big deal that if you go to tantalizers, there was a camera man just to take you picture that you came to tantalizers. <laughs> Fact. As a matter of fact, then, tantalizers will be advertising, have you tantalized her lately? Yeah. Tantalizers was a big deal. Today, go to Allen. Mr. Bix is there, tantalizers is there, KFC is there, go to the B, TFC has come, Sweet Sensation has come, go further down the road, there's munchies. So many of them, competition has come. But of course, before competition came to catch up with Mr. Bix on Allen, they come to Enugu. Before competition caught up with them in Enugu, they come to Port Harcourt. Before competition came to Port Harcourt, they come to Kaduna. You must keep moving. I remember 
In year 2010, when we went to Ogana to build our, our, our tank farm, Ogana is such a wonderful location. If you come to our tank farm in Ogana, our gate is a dual carriageway. Our backyard is a jetty. It's our own seaport. Ships come from abroad and come and bet in our backyard to discard petroleum products. Is the, is, the, or is the closest location to Abuja by road in terms of distribution of petroleum products and the north as a whole. Then when I fly into Benin and I'm going to Ogana, I will be laughing because it was a virgin territory and I say when the industry realizes its location, they will be surprised. I will be laughing. Today, when we opened the depot in 2011, it was an instant hit. Instant hit. We put all around the petroleum product importation map in this country by the grace of God. Today, you go to Ogana. Between, between 2011 and now, at least eight other tank farms have been built. And at least another five are still under construction. <laughs> Why? Competition will catch up with you. But you know the funny thing? Before all that happened, we had gone to Canada. Not only have we gotten another location, we have built it with permission it, and that one is running. And we moved on looking for the next location. In 2005, we built a petrol station in Asaba. If you enter Asaba, it's the first, it's a petrol station on the right, not before Summit Junction, for those of you who know Asaba well. This petrol station was doing so well, it was selling like for 5,000 liters of fuel in a day. So much fuel, so much money. But we didn't just stay there and say, oh, this is where God has watered our bread. The moment we opened that petrol station, of course, we started looking for the next location. Today, you go there, there are like three petrol stations to the left of it, four petrol stations to the right of it, maybe another six petrol stations opposite it. Why? Because as that station was doing well, the market was taking notice. And before competition will catch up with us in that location, of course, we move to the next location. The final thing I want to talk about is staying power. If you want to survive as a startup, you need to have what we call staying power. They say hustle while you wait. You see, for the, for the employee, if you have a job and they pay you your six million naira per annum, your income is 500,000 naira every month. It's fixed, it's firm, it's consistent. Businesses don't make money that way. If you run a business that makes 120 million naira profit in a year, it doesn't mean you make 10 million naira every month. Some good months you may make 40 million. Some bad months you may lose 5 million. Some other months you may just make 1 million. But you know what? Remain. I mean, it is staying power is what keeps you going even when nothing seems to be happening. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.